Hello, everyone, and welcome to this new episode of the Power Series, The Power of Plastic Rehab. Today, Positive Luxury's co-founder and CEO, Diana Verdenieto, will be in conversation with three amazing uh, guests. Uh, Tom Kay, um, the founder of Finisterre, a sustainable outdoor clothing brand inspired by the love of the sea. Uh, Sean Sutherland, a serial entrepreneur and co-founder of A Plastic Planet, a social uh, impact NGO dedicated to reducing single use plastic. And Nick Marks, the founder of EcoBoost, a company that transforms plastic uh, waste into sustainable events and experience. You can um, submit your questions anytime during the webinar in the Q&A box, uh, and the panel will answer them at the end. Over to you, Diana. Hi, Claudia. Um, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, hi, Nick, and hi, Sean, and Tom. Thank you for your time and, and for giving us the next 45 minutes, uh, which is going to be super exciting. So we have heard about plastic uh, probably for a long, long time, but I think plastic got into central stage sometime last year. And pre-COVID, everybody have been like kicking off the plastic habit. Now, obviously, we kind of fast forward for the last four months and somehow we all have to go some back onto rehab because some of us, I'm also guilty, have taken um, some of those plastic habits that we had before. Um, so, I mean, obviously, this is a, this is a global uh, topic, not just something local. And I mean, the three of you in different ways have been pioneering this movement. So I'd like to start with uh, you, Sean. So tell us a little bit more about your work at uh, Plastic Free Planet. Plastic Planet, actually. Yeah. Thank you, Diana, and uh, hello to everybody. Yes, so I, my name is Sean Sutherland. I'm co-founder of The Plastic Planet. And uh, we are, it's funny, I don't really call ourselves an NGO. We are uh, a pending corp because I'm a big believer in the B Corp, and I know Tom will talk about that later. Um, and we, we've uh, created a diff what we wanted to be a different kind of organization that really wanted to ignite and inspire business from inside, rather than per perhaps the original activist model, which is about attacking business from the outside. So we started three years ago, you know, myself and onto a massive plastic sinner. I cannot tell you how much plastic in my various businesses I have personally pumped out into the environment. It wasn't on my radar. So uh, three years ago, uh, we decided that we would create a, an organization that would really give people choice. And we started with the Plastic Free Isle campaign, opened the world's first Plastic Free Isle in Amsterdam. And since then, we've been very involved in trying to help industry accelerate the pace of change. We introduced the Plastic Free Certification Mark. We took over a North London supermarket for 10 weeks, turned 2,000 product lines plastic free. We work with big organizations like Unilever, Kraft Heinz. Our project, uh, our big campaign this year is Sack the Sachet, because nobody talks about these invisible little sachets of which we produce almost a trillion every single year. So that, that's what we do. So we're very pro-business and we only ever want to talk about solutions and really never linger on the problem because we all know there is a problem. Thank you so much, uh, Sean. And um, I guess, you know, kind of, um, is not just basically at the supermarket, this have gone everywhere. And I think the business world is as guilty uh, in terms not just about the products that they make, but actually everything else that we do in terms of events and, and uh, you know, kind of exhibitions, etc. I mean, Nick, can you tell us a little bit more about what you're doing and EcoBoost? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so we're, we're predominantly um, or started um, in the, on the event side of things. So um, we noticed, we know that events by their very nature are temporary and there's this big problem with them and that the, the event is temporary, but the waste that gets left behind is not. Um, so I started mapping out a business about three years ago, um, which took the idea of um, not only stopping using virgin materials, but potentially taking some of these plastics that we can't effectively recycle and using them as a base material. So what we've developed is machines and, um, and approaches to design that essentially take waste that can't be effectively recycled and then use it as the material to make everything from pop-up shops to stages to exhibition booths, furniture ranges, and so on. And the idea is that um, EcoBoot as a business um, wholeheartedly believe we need to stop using plastic, but we're also very aware of the millions, potentially billions of tons that is out there. 
So we see our role as, as helping to, to, to clean up problem plastics. So we work a lot with ocean plastics, which, are, which can't be re, re effectively used in a, in, a, in a circular model because of the different degradations and the different types and so on. So we're taking, frankly, the really mucky stuff that would, could, could only be incinerated for maybe a little bit of energy recovery and, and using it to do two things, to put it in a place where we were using virgin, but actually events as a communication tool, I'm biased, but I think it's the greatest communication tool in the world. Um, if, if, we put, if we build something from waste plastic and there's 10,000, 20,000, 2 million people there and they go home that night and they have dinner and they mention it to their children, their wives and their husbands, then actually what we're doing is we're raising awareness um, ar around a better way of doing things. Thank you so much, Nick. And of course, we heard about plastic and how bad plastic is. However, you know, can it, how do we see this every day? I'm a surfer, uh, not in London. Uh, I do this very often, but I am, I always say this every time I introduce Tom, I'm a real fan of, uh, of, your, of your brand. So tell us a little bit more about what you do and why plastic and the war on plastic is so important for, for your business. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you in the sea soon. We'll go, maybe we'll go for a surf together. Um, Yes, yeah, so uh, I'm Tom, the founder of Finisterre. It's a brand I started in 2003. It's really born from my love of the sea and a need to connect people to the sea and build innovative and sustainable products to enable that connection. And that's what we do. Um, and I did marine biology university, so I wasn't a businessman or fashion or that sort of thing, but I was well aware of kind of the problems presented um, you know, the human problems that present themselves in the ocean uh, and ultimately everything ends up in the ocean so um, it was really about working out how I could build a brand that would address this need as well as connect people to see and the idea being you connect people to see then they have an emotive connection to it and it maybe inspire a love of it with a love comes protection so then you think about how you consume what you consume um how you are on land and you get a more holistic view of your kind of your sort of position in the world i suppose so that was um the sort of idea behind the brand and you know we've sort of slowly you know it's taken a long time because 17 years ago this wasn't really in everyone's rhetoric as much as it is now uh, but we've been you know, really fighting to eliminate single-use plastic from our supply chains, all our bags are marine biodegradable that the products are out in. And I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's quite hard to totally eradicate plastic from our lives. You know, there isn't, there is some things, there's some, some parts that you need, you, need, you do need to have that sort of function by form by, um, it's where you can replace what has gone before with a more responsible um, circular model in terms of you know, how you use it. Thank you very much. And I think you, you said it, it's like how we can actually have a different way of thinking and this circularity yeah. side of things. Um, and I'd like to go to, to you, Sean, because you know, what you do is you, you talk about this circularity model and I will, I will go as far as saying we need to move from circularity to regenerative as well. So, the world has changed and I think it's going to change again. Um, we are about to enter probably one of the biggest recessions that has been known to humankind. So what does the world look like uh, in the next, you know, uh, I would say six to uh, 12 months and, uh, and beyond? And what are the emerging trends that, that we are seeing or that you are seeing um, in the industry? Because I think that in the name of sustainability, companies can do unbelievable cost savings um, and be great for them and for the planet. So what are those uh, mega trends or, or trends that, that you are seeing emerging um, specifically on plastic, but in general as well? I think what, what we've definitely seen is with the massive ramp up in the use of single use plastic, particularly you know, around PPE, but everything, everything has really reverted back to using this old you know, dinosaur material so through fear, we have quite understandably at the beginning of lockdown, we reverted back to using material of old, even though we know that we are creating this toxic time bomb for our, for our very near future through the misuse of this indestructible material plastic. So it's almost like the pendulum has swung so far back. And what we need to make sure is it will, it will swing back and we all collectively need to make sure there is significant momentum behind that swing back. And the things that I'm very encouraged by is just seeing that 
some of the plans that perhaps, perhaps um, city authorities had, like, you know, you hear Milan saying, we're about to dedicate 35 kilometers of our inner city space over to cyclists and pedestrians. We used to call it Plan 2030, now we call it Plan 2020. So I'm loving the fact that sometimes now we can see this new future rushing towards us at a completely different pace. And we need to make sure that this new future does embrace a care of nature as well. And um, the other thing that I'm very encouraged by is to see two major Northern European cities, capital cities, adopt the donut economic principles for the way that they will regrow their, you know, regenerate their economies post COVID. And when you're talking about regenerative economies beyond sustainability, and when you're talking about equality for people and the planet, and I think the way that Kate Rayworth has devised that very simple motif of the donut for us to think about things in a completely different way, no longer in this unsustainable, everlasting growth model that we all know is impossible, but thinking about things in a different way, thinking about not just growth, but thinking about thriving. So those are the real positives to me that are, I think if we, if we push hard, it's all going to have to come from governments. There is, there is a limit to how much industry can do. We cannot expect industry to please itself. We do not all have industry, you know, people in industry like Tom Kay, we wish we did. Uh, it's going to have to come from the top and that's where government has to step up now. Nick, do you agree with that? Do you think that business cannot be a force for good? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, we're Ikebuta, a B corporation, so you know everything we do is is based on that principle. I, I think as well, the first point is very right. What we're seeing with PPE um, is uh, it's kind of like um, a horror story all over again. If we need something, um, if we need lots of something and we need it fast, we turn to plastic. We turn to single-use plastic, and we turn to it without thinking um, about the consequences of of where that plastic's going to end up when we're done with it. Um, so I think that's the negative from this, but I also think that there is a huge positive and I think that um, the conversations I'm having, so we work with big brands um, and the conversations we're having with them is this downtime is being used to focus on one thing more than anything else and that's building back better. Um, so stuff which there, there are big brands who we talked with before who said we are going to do this, give me a month, give me two months, give me whatever, we're just in the middle of a 300 event campaign and now what's lovely is we've Give them a bit give them a bit of time to get back from furlough and then said there's no better time than now to talk about this you don't have any events until next year <laughs> we're all sat here we're all doing webinars we're all talking about this and so these conversations now are actually really good um you know we, we know that again pre this when, when when we go all the way back to the the launch of the sdgs forbes or whoever it was was talking about businesses um finding solutions being an 11 trillion dollar opportunity i think there's been other stuff that's come out this week again about green recovery on the back of this um so i think in, in a very strange way um that there is some some positives to take from this um but that doesn't help uh, when you sort of go into work in the morning and out the front of our production facility is masks and gloves in puddles No, I, uh, I totally hear you. And I think, you know, the business of the future not yet has been invented and they will be towards this green recovery. And uh, this is some of the conversations that we're having a positive luxury now. It's like uh, getting together people from CEOs uh, and, 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 and uh, people from the marketing world all together uh, and start having, and not from fashion or, or, or beauty, just from completely different industries to start talking about what this, you know, building back better means and what we can learn from each other to, to actually start creating jobs that not yet has been existing, existed. Um, I mean, Tom, what about you? Because, you know, in your business, this is, if you, if we don't solve these problems out, you have no business because we have no oceans um, that we actually would like to serve on. Um, so how do you tackle this and what are you seeing? So just remind me of the question again, sorry. The question was, uh, what do you think the world will look like and what emerging trends do you see coming through? Um, I think, you know, from my, from my point of view, I think that it's just been in this you know, lockdown period and since the pandemic struck, there's been a real, any trends that, probably have been there have been accelerated so 
there's an increasing conversation that brands and businesses are having with their community. There is an increasing uh, role of these brands and businesses to play their part in uh, any way um, solving the you know environmental crisis or the humanitarian crisis, whatever it is that's going on. There's there, you know whatever the the brand is set out to do the, the the these have become more and more important and you know we've always had a purpose and i think it's it's great to see you know a real galvanizing of um you know businesses really thinking about why they're here apart from being a business and you know and that's sustainability it's innovation it's culture it's uh black lives matter it's all of these things which are you know what is the role of your business or your brand at this point in time and how are you going to uh, convey what you're doing in an authentic way to your community? That's great, thank you. Thank you so much for that. And, and I mean, I'd like to say with you, what do you personally do in your business to change the status quo? Yeah, I mean, I think, it, you know, it's, it's potentially a very daunting um, question and, you know, listen, you can't fix everything, you know, so it's kind of, you've got to pick your battles. And if, you know, we, we're still a relatively small business, um, but we ultimately are, you know, very much believe that we have the power to affect change. And that goes right the way through our supply chain. You know, we work 17 years uh, demanding recycled fabrics, better um, transparency, you know, which we convey to our customers. We did a collaboration with Vans uh, Footwear, which is one of the most iconic, biggest footwear brands in the world uh, last autumn. And we actually pushed them to make their most sustainable range of shoes they've ever made. There's three styles. And so that was kind of showing you the power of a relatively small business like brand like Finisterre that can actually, you must never lose the kind of belief and the confidence that you can affect change in your industry or in your sector no matter what size you are. And that also goes down to customers actually about this kind of increasing role of activism. Everybody has a voice. Everybody has a consumer spending ability and how you choose to air that voice, how you choose to ask questions of business or brands that you're buying from and deciding whether you do or don't want to buy from them is it's never been more uh, relevant or easy with social media. So you, know, you have to, you know, as an individual, if you're not listening to this, you're not a business or a brand, everybody can play their role in asking the right questions and demanding this change that needs to happen. Thank you very much. I mean, and um, Nick, what about you? What, what are you seeing? What, what, um, what do you personally do in your business to, to affect this change? Sure, yeah. So, so prior to launching Ecobooth, I, I, I set up and ran an event production company for 10 years that, that did things the way that horrified me and made me want to change it. So when I started to look at that four or five years ago and wondered if I could make some changes along the way, I very quickly realized that I couldn't because sustainability comes from the ground up. And so, so I started again. So we're a bit fortunate there in the, even down to our basics of making sure that we are zero waste as a business, not zero waste to landfill, and making sure we run on renewable energy, um, making sure we balance purpose and profit long way. That, you know, those bits are in there um, from the start. Um, but the, the, you know, the, the big bit for us is really about um, positive impact. So that, that's been the sort of the, um, the word that's, that's stuck there from the beginning. So everything we're doing, we're, we're trying to take waste plastic and, and, and stop it from going to worse places. But then we're also trying to um, use events to tell people about cool new things. So to put it into a, a, a really simple example, if we made a furniture set from plastic pulled out the ocean, we would then, we would then finish that furniture set using um, non-toxic paints and we would make fabric seats which were used which were made from ikonil and stitched and other materials which i'm sure tom's far more familiar than me so so plus you know materials that are better so we're doing two things at once we're showing we're enlightening people and showing them a better way of doing things as well as cleaning up and i think that's really important thank you i mean sean with your certification and your work, you are the change. So tell us a little bit more how you're doing that and, and what are the benefits that you are, or the real improvements that you're seeing industry-wide? Well, the, there are some positive stories and some people are really trying to, to make change happen. You're absolutely right. And 
Uh, and for us, and, and I know from, with Nick and Tom and all this, the, the case studies that they've just been telling us today, it is, you have to lead by example. And one of the things that we want to do, obviously with the Plastic Free Isle and then our North London supermarket, but even our Plastic Free PPE, you know, Nick just referred to this, this horror of the amount of plastic that we're seeing everywhere. And we thought rather than complain about it, let's produce something that is 100% wood-based. So this is cellulose home compostable so if it does end up in the environment it does it's not going to have that level of indestructible toxicity that all this plastic PPE is going to have so some of the the things that, that we're seeing now is that people are very nervous of moving from one material to another and we've recognized that there is a huge knowledge gap between the designers and the specifiers and the brand owners and the makers and the converters of all these different materials so one of the projects that we've been working on, and actually lockdown has been a little bit fortuitous for that, to give us some, some headspace, uh, is developing the world's first uh, platform, a connection hub, to connect the designers and the makers together. So we, we've been working with IBM to create the world's first connection platform, which is a library of all of the world's materials with lots of case studies and interesting reference because people really need to know, yes, I mean, algae, what an incredible material, but how can I use it? I'm designing, a, I don't know, a skincare packaging. How can I actually use it? So to be able to go to a resource library and see, you can combine it with pulp and this is the qualities that you'll get. And here's the impact of that because of course, everything that we take from the planet will have some kind of impact. And there is such a, 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 a high degree of fear with big business particularly because there is so much misinformation about plastic that they are scared to move from the plastic road to ruin to another path because they are worried that they will be criticized for perhaps they've incurred another kind of impact and when people talk about life cycle analysis and i spend my days on zoom calls with big brands who are saying but when i look at the life cycle analysis plastic is the winner because it's lighter on carbon and i have to say Guys, please show me the life cycle analysis from the minute that it is taken out of the ground, the toxicity that creates, to the fact it has, a, it, there is no end of life for plastic unless it's burnt. And we all know where burning fossil fuels has got us today. Where is that life cycle and where is the impact on the marine environment, let alone on the soil? You know, in the UK, we have more plastic in our soil than we do in our oceans. So nobody even talks about these things. Where, where is the measure, the metric, where is the responsibility for what we have done to the planet? Because it isn't just about this little bit of when you use material. So that's one of the things that we've, we've been up to at A Plastic Planet is just trying to give people information because otherwise it, everybody is in this fear vacuum of not knowing how to change. That is fantastic. Well, thank you so much for that. And, and I mean, I can't believe that is already uh, um, 2.23. So, um, last questions from me, and is what is the one thing, one action that um, you would get people to, to, to follow in order to tackle uh, this plastic issue? Um, perhaps I'll start with Nick. Sure, yeah. Um, I think, um, look, for me, it's, 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 it's asking questions. We just have to keep, it's, it's a, it sounds like an obvious one, but um, I unfortunately, I'm not, I, I, um, you know, I'm not a sustainable, a sustainable professional. I didn't study this. I, um, so four or five years ago, when I started to map this out and I started to Google big event companies and look at their policies and how they were doing things, um, I realized pretty quickly that that stuff was pretty weak. Just, and then that's me being kind because I don't know if we can swear on this thing. <laughs> but, you know, so, so, I, was, so, so, so I, I went from there and, and very quickly learned. And, and the reality is that through asking the right questions, we learn about this very quickly. I came across an industry that was essentially living on zero waste landfill that had been developed like 15, 20 years before and was considered acceptable, but actually in this day and age meant very little and offered very little as well in terms of sustainability. And I think it's as I've gone along and, and worked with brands, that's where we've got to, um, you've got huge brands coming out saying, um, you know, here's a shampoo, it's made from ocean plastic, but then you look at the back of it and it's made from 59% ocean plastic. And then you say, well, what's the rest of it? And they say, it's virgin plastic. Well, that's useless. That's not getting us anywhere, you know? Um, and then you say, well, why is it 59%? They say, oh, because the FDA say that 59% means you can say it's recycled on the front of the bottle. And these are all things that I've literally just learned through asking questions and questioning stuff along the way. Um, even last week, a coffee company sent me some brilliant um, coffee pods that uh, go into the Nespresso and then they compost afterwards. 
but I live in Hammersmith and Fulham and we don't compost stuff here. And so I said that to a few people and they said, yeah, well, you just put it in your normal bin. If you put it in the recycling, it's actually a bigger problem than anything else. And so all these things are there to be learned along the way. And if we look at those who are doing way better than us, um, kids in Scandinavia, for example, know a huge amount more than here because they're being educated at school about these things, how to recycle effectively. Um, so look, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm still nowhere near to being a sustainability professional, but I've got to where I've got to in less than five years through just asking the, what I hope are the right questions and difficult questions along the way. And you can do that without being an activist or an eco warrior or anything else crazy. You know, I built a, a successful business on the back of it. So yeah, that to me, that's the big thing is just, just keep questioning everything along the way and, and we'll get there quicker. We've got to accelerate this. Yeah, I agree. Thank you so much, Nick. And Tom, what about you? Um, yeah, I just think it's, you know, it's, it's thousands and millions of micro actions have kind of got us into this mess. So, you know, the power of many, many co collective micro actions, wherever they are in your home, with your family, whatever, it, however small it might be, is, um, is going to be yeah, that, that we can also reverse that. Um, and just to sort of reiterate Nick's point, I think, you know, customers have just got to, you know, and community have got to get on and, um, Ask, ask different questions of brands and there is a lot of sort of spin out there more actually more now than ever was before about you know these claims and what's going on so you know look for certification like positive luxury or beak or whatever it is that really show that the brands have been independently assessed to the level of um sustainability or type of business that they are and they've that, that's been proven you know they can, you can sort of stand behind the the, the accreditation or whatever it is Thank you. I love that. It's like a lot of micro actions got us into this mess. A lot of micro actions will get us out of this mess. We'll use that. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, um, I think we have lots of questions from the audience. So hopefully you guys are ready. Um, I'll start with Anna. Um, Sean, uh, thank you very much for your uh, comments about lack of information about plastic issues, LTA problems, etc. cetera. Uh, she hasn't asked, asked question, but she just says thank you. Um, <laughs> Uh, but also, actually, there is an anonymous question to you, Sean. Um, how do you think everyday consumers can avoid plastic from the supermarket? Can currently your average shop is full of plastic packaging that is not able to even be recycled? And I kind of, I have this hate for one supermarket that everything is plastically wrapped, plastic wrapped. So yeah, love the answer, uh, Sean, please. Yeah, um, it's, it's really difficult and we continue to really pressurise the supermarkets because for us it's always been the, the least defensible use of plastic is something that we wrap our perishable food and drink. You know, it's, it's used for moments and then it exists forever. Uh, so, of course, we've all seen the rise in zero waste stores and we have to champion people that are doing the right thing. It might be a little bit more effort and it might take a little bit more time, but, but there is no point us paying lip service so, oh, I'm so irritated by all the plastic in the supermarkets as we grab the bag of apples rather than taking individual ones. We all are those people. We're equally addicted to convenience. I think fundamentally, I'm very conscious right now that we, we're under a bit of pressure to go out and buy. There's this whole thing of it's our civic duty now. Go out and consume. And I'm, I'm, actually, I want to push against that. I feel we need to buy less. We need to buy better. We need to stop lying to ourselves that things are being recycled because other than the good work that Nick is doing, there is bare, nothing is actually being recycled. Less, less than 10% of any plastic is recycled in the UK once, rarely twice. Less than 5% in the US is recycled. We export over 60% of our rubbish from the UK to places like Turkey and Mozambique and Myanmar. I mean, shame on us. So I, I'm really sorry to burst that recycling bubble, but there are no recycling fairies and we've got to stop lying to ourselves. So fundamentally with supermarkets, it's just be a bit grumpier about it. Moan to the supermarkets, write to the supermarkets, because they think everybody's not noticing anymore. In the name of COVID, they have reverted to old practices and then champion those people who are doing the right thing. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, this is a great question, I don't know who would like to take it. How do you think developing countries can tackle the plastic problem as currently to, as currently to be able to avoid uh, it is an economic privilege? Who would I, like to take that? 
I can mention something on that, if, if useful. We did a big um, workshop, uh, a plastic hackathon with Unilever, which focused on exactly that problem. They pump out 46 billion plastic sachets every single year, majorly for distribution in developing markets, because it's an affordability issue, and this is how somebody in a developing market can buy a Unilever product. They won't buy a bottle of detergent, they'll buy a sachet. And yet we all know where those sachets are going to end up. And one man's trash is everybody's problem. We own, we're united by one ocean. So for the last 12 months, we've been working with Unilever to try and change that. How can we have a sachet that it is properly biodegradable, even in a marine uh, environment? Or is there a whole system where we can have no packaging at all, where it can just have some kind of biomembrane? So there is nothing to throw away. And I think developing countries, I mean, if, if, I, if they have a voice like we have a voice, just as Tom was saying, we all vote with our wallets. At whatever level of spend, we vote with our wallets. And everybody who lives in an emerging market can buy better. We do not have to aspire to these Western brands that are simply pumping plastic upon us. Thank you, Sean. Um, uh, a question from Neil says, how are products certified that, are, that have 100% ocean plastic packaging? Is it regulated by a government body? Okay, this is for you, for you also. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I can, do you want me to step in? I mean, in terms of, of, of us, we're, we're taking it straight from source. So um, through, uh, through, as of the count, out from councils and from the Rivers and Canals Trust and other places like that. Um, in terms of the actual products we're finishing with um, at EcoBooth, when we just developed this model, um, the go-to really is, is cradle to cradle still in terms of adding, adding new things to stuff. So when, we're, when we have a, a company come to us and say, we want to make this, uh, this, this, this catwalk and we want it to look like this and this and this and then we look at the products that we can make from waste and the stuff that we need to use virgin that's when we turn to, to cradle to cradle um, so that would be my but in terms of a, a certification um, that says this has come out of the ocean um, there yeah the, 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 this doesn't exist yeah, but there's very little standard certification made out of Plastic Planet. As you mentioned before, Diana, we have a plastic free certification mark, but that means any kind of plastic, you know, whether that is a, a non compostable bioplastic or a fossil fuel plastic or a recycled plastic, you know, it, it's all plastic to us. Um, so then it, it is a mark that sits on the front of packaging that simply re reassures the shopper in that moment they have in a supermarket aisle that we've done the due diligence with our materials experts, and this pack is 100% plastic free. Yeah, there, can I just add, there's one other quite interesting thing there which might be worth throwing in, is that what's been interesting over the last few years is you've had this surge in um, ocean awareness, and Tom, I'm sure you've come across this, is there's, there's now become an, a, a marketplace for, for ocean plastic, and one of the most popular phone calls to the inquiries phone at EcoBooth is, hi, I'm so-and-so, can you tell me where you get your ocean plastic? And when I first launched EcoBooth, um, that was one of my questions. And I very quickly got met with, you can have as much as you want if you buy 20 tons of it, which is all good and well. But when you're trying to prototype something new, you know, if you're a student and so on and so on, and there's now stuff like Plastic Bank where there's actually a marketplace being built, um, I'm not going to give an opinion on whether I think that that's right or wrong, but it's a, it's, it's a, it gives you some idea of um, the, the change that is, that, that is being made to that over the last few years as, as a result of awareness. Thank you very much, Nick. I mean, I think this is a question probably for Tom. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is a question from a consumer to brand owner. What do you think I, uh, what do you think I can do to pressure my favorite brand to be more responsible with plastic? I've mailed several times and I call others, but I have not. Uh, I wouldn't say they'd be your favorite brand anymore. Find another brand. I mean, that's the whole sort of thing is, you know, they kind of, if this is really important to you and you really believe in it and they've answered questions and you've demanded, you know, have a conversation with them about what they're doing about it and not getting back to you. It clearly isn't important to them and it is important to you. So your values are misaligned. You need to move on. I love that. I love um, that. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so if you're in the business that's doing that, you know, there's people that are working, oh, I get asked a lot, I'm, I'm working in a business and I'm trying to bring change with this business and I can't do it. It's like, well, you know, you know, 
without making it too simplistic, um, you know, you have you have a power to, you know, say this isn't a business that I want to work for anymore. And that's why the purpose element comes into it and about, you know, but getting into business, either working for or buying from businesses that you really believe in are there beyond just being a business. Mm, absolutely. And there's I mean, an authenticity element to that as well, obviously. I totally agree with that. I actually did a quote for, for a magazine today and I said, it's not enough to have a purpose, but you have to live it every day because it's great to have it written down somewhere, but it's how do you enable your, your employees to live it? So it's great. Um, okay, I work with an airline and I want to develop sustainable packaging for skincare and bags for the uh, amenity kits. What do you think is the future of airline kits? Um, that's a really interesting question because a friend of mine actually supplies airlines his business supplies airlines and he is um he's just flipping or he's become b Corp certified and he's just moving all of his product that he made that's incredibly wasteful um or you know historically kind of wasteful to um you know more sustainable or recyclable um products so i can put you in touch with you on but he'd be a good person to speak to i don't know the industry very well but um get my email off um off the off the, off the webinar and i could help out that'd be help it is, a, it is a, it's a really interesting question actually yeah. because i took a flight um 10 days ago and so it was quite interesting being back at an airport and seeing what had changed and obviously everywhere but even stepping onto the plane and i was handed a plastic bag with and they were filling them next to me, so it wasn't like it was sterilized. I was handed a plastic bag with, with an antibacterial wipe in a plastic sachet in it, and I was handed it to say, in case you'd like to disinfect your area. And the whole thing was just madness to me. Number one, it was an antibacterial wipe, and we're talking about a virus here. And, and just the, the ridiculous use of plastic. And when I said, no, don't worry, I don't want it, they said, no, you have to have it. And just everything on that flight, that again, the amount of plastic that was being used, used was just phenomenal. And when you're looking at in-flight amenities programs, there is so much new development now and innovation in paper. And that's where I would be looking. And I, I just came off a call actually with a Swedish paper manufacturer and what they're doing in single dose, beautiful formats uh, in, in, uh, that is highly sustainable and we're looking now at new coatings so that you make them completely waterproof, all of those things. The future is really happening very quickly and we need some big brands to just adopt it and that will accelerate the change. We've had, we've had the, a, a couple of these, they've been in the media, the, the first plastic free flights, haven't we? I think we did, did um, um, at Emirates maybe did one of them, was it? And there was, um, so th there's bits there, but we actually got stopped by COVID, but we had a project going in at, at Dubai Airport that was for a, a drinks brand that was made from uh, just over two tons of plastic cutlery taken off aeroplanes. The reason it can't be effectively recycled is because it's the contamination of food waste in there as well. So it has to be incinerated. So again, I won't uh, name and shame where we got it from, but it came from one of the catering companies who, who looked after one of the big airlines. Um, and so it, you know, you, you, you're talking, but if we think about how small a plastic fork is, and we think about how heavy two and a half tons of plastic is, and then we think about how easily EcoBooth got hold of it to, to recreate this thing from it. Um, I think we get yeah, some idea of, of how big that problem is and how great it would be if, if companies like the one mentioned can, can come along and, and bring better solutions in for sure. Thank you. Um, do you guys think that uh, bioplastics can be the solution for plastic issue? I don't know who would like to take that. I'd love to first just clarify what kind of bioplastic we're talking about because there are two very different materials called bioplastic and one is uh, often made from a, a crop starch like corn um, or sugar and that is a bioplastic that once it is made into a plastic is bioidentical to a fossil fuel plastic. So it's the beginning of life is sustainable but the material itself has exactly the same never end of life that a fossil fuel plastic has. So those kind of bioplastics, the only advantage to them are that they come from a sustainable source, unlike fossil fuels, but they do not fix the problem in any way They're because they still will pollute the planet at the rate that we're seeing. The other kind of bioplastic we call a biomaterial because it's so confusing for, for the public particularly. And that one is certified compostable. Nature knows how to handle it. It's a very strict certification process 
and it goes back to the soil. So this one, there is a future for. This one, I do not see as being any part of the real answer. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, and I think the last question, um, littering is a big problem. What do you think we can do to tackle this problem overall? Um, I mean, all that stuff after the lockdown sort of eased, you know, that first weekend when there's all those tons of plastic, oh, you know, rubbish, but you just got to, I mean, look at countries like Canada or a place like that where you get fined $200, whatever, for dropping a cigarette butt, and they don't have that problem. <laughs> I think it's got to be yes, education. I mean, we before this, when we were having a quick chat, I said I, I, I was down in, a, in Cornwall, near, very near to Tom's place last week with a, a great charity called Surfs Against Sewage. And I think if you can get kids onto those beaches and you can let them see, a, you know, a, 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 a chocolate bar wrapper or a cotton bud or whatever, you know, um, inside a, a, something that's, that's, that's died ultimately, um, that's... You know that that's sort of how we have to raise awareness. You know, I was being brought up in the '80s. That was unknown to me. You know, we just um, you know, that, that that early throwaway culture. And we've we've got to build on that. We've got to educate people from as, as young as we can. That even the the smallest things, even a a, a cap from a, a sports drink, um, can have a devastating impact uh, on the environment for hundreds and hundreds of years. I think we, we also, much as I completely agree with both of you, we need to be clear that the ocean plastic problem is not about litter. It's much, much bigger than litter. And it's always been the case for big brands to slightly deflect responsibility, particularly the likes of brands like Coca-Cola, to say, OK, we, we will continue to pump it out in what we call a recyclable material, even though there is no industry of note to recycle it. But we will deflect the responsibility and say, if only, if only the public would recycle better, if only the public would stop littering and they put it in the right bin. Since when was it our problem that they decide to make it out of the wrong material in the first place? So this is where the blame lies. And this is where, when we talk about what's the change that we need to see in the near future, it's extended producer responsibility. If a brand chooses to continue to make something out of plastic or any material, they are responsible for its second, third, fourth, fifth forever life. And that is true extended producer responsibility. And these are new laws that every European government are talking about right now. And we, the public, need to make sure that they don't get watered down. Because trust me, if industry is responsible for what happens to their packaging after it's been used, they will make it out of better materials. I could not agree more with you. And hopefully, you know, these things will happen and not just for European countries, will happen for the world because we, we only have one planet and, you know, we are on, all in it and we are all in it together. So I hope this is actually something that is globally adopted, not just something in Europe. And uh, thank you very much, Sean, Tom, and Nick, for your time uh, and your brain power and your optimism uh, and solutions. And uh, I'd like to hand it over to Claudia. Yes, thank you all. Thank you, uh, Tom, Sean, and Nick, for your time today. And thank you all for joining us today. Next week on Thursday at 2 p.m., uh, we'll be discussing the power of a purpose driven business with uh, three amazing guests. Subscribe to our newsletter today to receive your special invitation. We will see you next week. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. 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 Bye.